Back in the mid-80s, the Sunset Strip in Los Angeles became the hotbed for glam metal on the West Coast, but the East Coast would produce many worthy contenders with bands like Bon Jovi, Twisted Sister, and Cinderella making it big. Around this time, a Paramus New Jersey quartet called Trickster would follow in their footsteps. And although they gained traction during this time, their big break wouldn't happen until the end of the decade and near the very end of glam metal's Day in the Sun. Today, let's explore the history of Trickster. The first iteration of Trickster would be the band Raid, which came together in June of 1983. At this time, the band consisted of Steve Brown on guitar and vocals, and bassist Doug Cowie, and drummer Mike Payne to round out the lineup. Brown, for his part, was musically gifted, being just 12 years old when they formed the band, and he would admit in the book Nothing But A Good Time that he started playing guitar when he was just 7, and it would be the band Kiss who convinced him to pick up the instrument, and it would be Eddie Van Halen's song Eruption that, and I quote, hit me like a ton of bricks. On the Rock and Roll and Coffee show, Brown would recall honing his chops by being taught by guitar player Ross Barata and sitting in on sessions of a local band called Harlette, which was led by Barata's friend Ray Gillen. Brown would describe his familiarity with the members saying, They used to rehearse across the street from Paramus High School where we went to high school. Mike Payne used to cut the drummer's lawn at his house and we used to go and watch them rehearse in the garage. It was my first experience being around a real rock band. Up until this point, Brown was Raid's frontman, but by early 1984, he'd switch primarily to the guitar and find a worthy successor in Pete Lauren, recalling, Pete was like four years older than me and one of the best looking guys in town. I talked to him on the phone because he was really into Van Halen, Judas Priest, and Boston. One time I asked him, hey, why don't you be my singer? And he was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. I was already singing and writing songs, so I kind of taught him how to sing. Then Ray hooked him up with his great vocal coach, Bob Fitzgerald, and that's how it started. After a single live performance as Ray, drummer Mike Payne would be replaced by Mark Scott, and the band promptly changed its name to Trickster. The move would pay off as their live shows with this new lineup earned them a strong following. Scott would speak about how they'd increased their presence around New Jersey, telling Jason Green of the Waste Some Time podcast, We did it very much like they did on the Sunset Strip, with flyers and hitting people up. We were high school kids, for crying out loud, so the ingenious thing we did was everything was like a homework assignment. If we needed flyers, we did them in graphic design class, we got graded on our flyers that did extra credit by making extra flyers, we went out to Bergen Mall, Paramus Park, and Garden State Plaza and nailed everybody. Everything became a billboard for us. By 1987, Trickster would move up the ranks, opening for some big name acts like Kix and Skid Row, which garnered attention from record labels. Side note guys, I've done career retrospectives of both Kix and Skid Row, the links are down below. With this newfound recognition, they'd eventually head to Bear Track Studios in New York to record their first demo tape titled Just Having Fun. They'd enlist the help of Guns N' Roses engineer Nelson Ayers, and although their demo was put out in 1988, evidence of the tape would only come to light as recently as late 2019. In a separate interview, Scott spoke with Mick Michaels of The Cosmic View about the demo, which involved the band utilizing a similar approach, saying, We created the cassette inserts and labels in graphic class and made it look like a real packaged album. This gave us the opportunity to sell it as a product, which proved to be quite lucrative for a bunch of kids in high school. Despite the demo selling well initially with fans, it wouldn't be pushed to the labels who were courting the group with Scott recalling, just having fun didn't see the light of day because we actually made a new demo tape with our new management, Shark Entertainment, that was used to shop for a record deal. Newer songs with better production, but that's not to say that those older songs weren't great. In November of 1988, bassist Doug Cowie was replaced by PJ Farley, and by May of 89, Trickster managed to sign a deal with Mechanic Records, a heavy metal subsidiary of major label MCA. Brown barely finished high school thanking his father, who was the vice principal, for sweet talking his teachers. Like Scott had alluded to about the band's first demo, some of its material stood out. Trickster soon went to Hollywood to record their self titled debut album in Sound City with Bill Ray, and the songs Only Young Once and Ride the Whip from the demo would be re recorded and included as tracks 6 and 11, respectively. The album's artwork was done by the late Neil Adams, famous for his work with DC Comics, and Scott would praise his approach while referencing a time they met at a recent comic book convention saying, when he does an autograph, he doesn't just sign his name. He takes a large index card and makes a scene. He was making those dots and dashes all over the card. I look and I'm like, what the hell is he doing? All of a sudden, I see a face emerge out of the paper. Trickster's self-titled debut album would be released on May 29th, 1990, and would earn them buzz when the radio single Line of Fire got some airplay, but serious fortune would strike the band once they filmed a music video for their first official single, Give It To Me Good. Halfway through their national tour, they became the opening act for Striper, 
and by October they embarked on another tour in support of Dawkin. It was on the later tour that the video for the song entered rotation on MTV and soon reached number one on Dial MTV's Top 10 Video Countdown, where it stayed for 13 weeks. Trickster's follow-up single One in a Million, whose video took place at a sold-out show in Rockland County, New York, would peak at number 75 on the pop charts. By early 1991, the album was consistently pulling in weekly sales of about 20,000 copies, and Trickster would go on to their very first arena tour in support of Poison. By April, while on the Hit Between the Eyes tour in support of the Scorpions, Trickster played a hometown show at the Meadowlands Arena, where MTV presented them with gold records during an after-party event, indicating their debut record sold in excess of 500,000 copies. From there, the album peaked at number 28 on the Billboard 200 charts, and a third video for the single Surrender would hit the airwaves in June, once again topping the Dial MTV countdown. Frontman Pete Lauren would comment on their surplus of tours by this time, telling the publication May the Rock Be With You. Some of it remains a blur, but all those tours are now really great memories. The tour with Warren and Firehouse was very special though. It was called the Sleeper Tour of the Year. All other shows were rotten that year and we were just mowing them down. Low ticket prices brought in the fans night after night. Brilliant idea and great lineup. The fact that all the bands genuinely got along also contributed to the success of the tour. Lauren would also poke fun at being an unintentional trendsetter in the band's rise to fame, later commenting, It's true. In 1989, during one of our first photo sessions in LA, I had a flannel shirt with me for some reason and I tied it around my waist. Who would have known? It was something different that I kept on doing and others seemed to have liked it too. By 1992, the musical climate had shifted and Trickster also sought a change. They would renegotiate their deal with MCA Records in order to be signed to the label directly and their new album would feature a heavier sound by Queensryche producer Jim Barton and they also chose an abstract image for the cover instead of a band photo to shift emphasis towards their music. The band would spend $600,000 making their second record with Brown revealing in the book Nothing But A Good Time, we got suites at the LaDuffy Hotel in Hollywood, we each got a Mustang GT convertible to drive around in, we're living it, we're doing the thing, it was kind of like here it is, we're going to do this like big boys, you know, as long as we don't spend 2 million bucks, we're going to be okay. Their second album titled Here would see a release on October 13th, 1992, almost one year after Nirvana's breakthrough album Nevermind came out. The band went about their usual business opening for Kiss on a national tour, but there were troubling signs ahead. The band would spend a quarter of a million dollars on the video for Road of a Thousand Dreams. The band noticed that MTV didn't play the video with Brown adding in the same book. We're a month into the KISS tour, and finally we get a call that MTV's not playing your video. A year earlier we'd played Arco Arena in Sacramento with the Scorpions and sold it out, 22,000 people. When we did it with KISS, there was 1,500 people there. By January of next year, they'd release a music video for the single Rock and Horse and continue on a club tour called Here Club for Men as headliners. On the upside, the album was generating traction overseas in both Japan and Europe, but by the end of the tour in mid-1993, Trickster would come up short. The album in America was a commercial failure, only having reached number 109 on the Billboard 200 charts and sold about 20% as many units as their debut record. The final nail in the coffin was when the band got offered to open for Bon Jovi on their Keep the Faith European tour, but there was one condition. Bon Jovi wanted Trickster's label to pay them $100,000 for the opening slot, and they said no. Instead, the label asked the band if they wanted to use their publishing money to get the opening spot on the tour, and the members also said no. By 1994, Trickster's final offering at the time would be a covers EP called Undercovers. It sold poorly, and this prompted MCA to drop the band, and they soon broke up afterwards. When asked why the band wasn't as big as they could have been, Brown surmised it was because of their label, telling the publication Music and Other Drugs in 2021. It didn't help that we were on the worst possible label because they had no clue what to do with us. Had we been on Geffen, Polygram, or Epic, we'd been having a completely different conversation. But that's unfortunately not how things worked out. I'm not complaining because we're still talking about it 30 years later. However, I do wish we had more time to build on the strengths of that first album. Brown would go on to praise the second album here, adding, We took a giant leap from the first album. It was a major record for us in a lot of ways. I was just interested in what guys like Mutt Lang and Bob Rock were doing in the studio. We weren't a little kid band anymore with that album, but we never had a chance to continue even further with the support of our label. By the late 90s, Pete Lauren had relocated to Arizona playing gigs on the local club circuit, and Brown and PJ Farley returned to the New Jersey scene making music together in the band Soaked and later 40 Feet Ringo. Meanwhile, Mark Scott became the director of marketing at Sports World Amusement Park, an indoor arcade in Paramus. By 1999, Trickster was featured on the program Where Are They Now, Metal Mania, 
and Scott humorously commented on the time that he noticed PJ Farley for the first time in a long time, saying, Just a few months ago I was walking through the mall and I saw PJ pass by. We were neck and neck and shoulder to shoulder and he didn't recognize me. I lived with the guy for years on a bus and all over America. He didn't even see me. I almost didn't recognize him because he looks very different today too. But by 2008, Trickster made a comeback, reuniting their classic lineup for the Give It To Me Good Tour and they would also release a live album called A Live In Japan which would be re-released in conjunction with the relaunch. Toward the end of November, the band played their first hometown show in over a decade at the Dexter Entertainment Complex in Riverdale, New Jersey, and were featured with a full-page article in The Record, which was the largest newspaper in the area. Four years later, they'd officially return with their third studio album, New Audio Machine. The album once again would be a self-produced effort by guitarist Steve Brown, and feature over half a dozen guest spots of musicians from New Jersey's music scene. Brown would explain the decision for releasing a new album at this point in time, telling the pop break, Honestly, I think the band has never been better these days. As singers, as writers, as musicians, as performers, we're better than we've ever been. So why not? Part of it was the fact that our last record we made together was the Undercovers record, which was all cover tunes. I said to the guys, if this is the last thing we ever record, which it definitely is not going to be, all I want to do is be able to make a great big rock record. So it's kind of a bookend, so to speak, of our career instead of ending up in a compilation, a live record, and a covers record. By 2015, Trickster would release their most recent album, Human Era, which centered on the band returning to their roots. Bassist PJ Farley would come up with the album's concept, Trickster is currently on tour, and is scheduled to play alongside groups like Firehouse, Kicks, Queensryche, and many more later this summer. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. We'll see you again at Rock and Roll True Stories.